from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco, in for Emily Chang. Coming up in the next hour, second half momentum is picking up steam. Both the S&P 500 and Nasdaq 100 posting their longest streak of weekly gains since November. But earnings have shown a mixed outlook for the rest of the year. Is this tech rally going to last? Plus, Walmart, Home Depot, Target, Lowe's next week is a big one for retailers reporting earnings. Consumer sentiment has been rough the past few months, but new data suggests we're turning a corner. We'll chat all things e-commerce. And competition for electric semi-trucks is heating up after the Senate passed a roughly $347 billion initiative to boost the transition to clean energy and cut emissions. Right now, it's pretty much Tesla versus Nikola, but tax incentives could lure more players into the race. But first, the Federal Bureau of Investigation sees classified records, some marked top secret from former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. That's according to a copy of the warrant seen by Bloomberg. Wendy Benjaminson is our deputy managing editor for Bloomberg News over in Washington. Wendy, th thanks for joining us this Friday. Let's stick to the, the basics here. What did we learn from the unsealed documents? Well, we learned not as much as one would hope. We learned that they did get about two dozen boxes of documents um, from, from the Mar-a-Lago estate. We know that some of them were, as you said, top secret or even higher um, sensitive compartmented information, which means it is only supposed to be in a closed room, sealed off from cell phones and all sorts of other um, interference. And those were, you know, sitting around Mar-a-Lago. Um, we also know that they were searching for evidence of violations of three crimes, including a segment of the Espionage Act. I am not saying Donald Trump is going to be charged with espionage, but there's a subsection of that which relates right. to mishandling of classified documents. We don't know that there is evidence of that. We just know that they got these documents. Wendy, what is the concern here? What are the DOJ and investigators looking at, looking for? Well, this all started when the National Archives, which uh, keeps presidential records and then gives them to a president's you know, library, um, they had been working with Trump's representatives throughout 2021. They got the transfer of 15 boxes in January of this year, and they began re looking through them and realized that there was classified national security information. We don't know what exactly that means yet. And um, that prompted the archives to reach out to the Justice Department and say, hey, you may want to get these back. So that's what this action was. We don't know if it's going to relate to any of the cases against Donald Trump. It depends on, I think, when we know what, what the documents actually show. But um, you can be sure that the uh, Justice yeah. Department will be coming through those this weekend. Wendy, it's always the question, but, but what happens next? I think we don't know is the, is the answer, I'm afraid. We, we know that they will go through these and try to figure out what, um, what was in here, what crimes might be violated, and then they'll decide whether to charge or start talking to the former president. Right. Well, we continue to follow your team's coverage, Wendy, over the weekend. That's Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson out in D.C. Thank you. Let's get a check on where markets ended the week with Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld out in New York. Katie, tech, ending the week strong. Pretty strong. It was a big risk on day, as you can see from the board behind me. This isn't it. This is single stocks. But if you look at the indexes, for example, you saw the S&P 500 finish higher. You saw the Nasdaq 100 finish higher as well. There we go. You did see bonds rally a little bit, but just five basis points or so, Ed. I'm going to really just continue to fold that into this risk on mood. You saw Bitcoin manage to squeak a little bit of a gain. Of course, the board has flipped to the after hours trade, but Bitcoin higher. You can see it is 
$24,000 a coin. We haven't been at those levels in a little bit. And this was, again, a big finish to what's been a really big week. If you look at the NASDAQ 100, for example, this was the fourth straight week of gains. If you look back at this chart, you see a lot of red on this screen. That is the longest consecutive weekly rally since all the way back in November 2021. So I don't know, maybe we're at the bull market. But in any case, uh, it's been quite a run, especially for those tech stocks. Now let's look at some of those individual names. As you can see, Pinduoduo up top, lower today. That's, of course, after news this morning about China delisting five of its largest state-owned enterprises, state-owned companies, rather, from U.S. exchanges. That weighed on ADRs. But you go down the list, again, very strong. You had chips coming back. You had Peloton surging on a Mark Gurman scoop, of course, that they're going to cut about 800 jobs. They're going to shut stores. They're going to raise the cost of some of their products, just part of this big overhaul that we're seeing at that company. And Tesla, too, rallying almost 5%, maybe part of the broader risk on mood in the market, maybe because you're getting married, Ed, will remain uh, to continue to watch that story. But again, a big move for Tesla. Thank you, Katie. That's one M&A report that I'm able to confirm <laughs> or live on there. Bluebird's Katie Greifeld out in New York. Thank you. And as you point out, Peloton, a big mover, but Friday tech broadly outperforming in equity markets. I'm absolutely delighted to bring in Mel Lagomasino, CEO of We Family Offices, which has $15 billion in assets under management. Mel, it's good to see you again. Great What's your takeaway? You yeah, thank you. What's your takeaway from this week in the markets? Well, I think that um, it's been a great week and actually it's been a great month for uh, for tech and I think that it has to do with the fact that uh, people are starting to believe that we're going to get inflation under control inflation is what will kill the earnings uh, of tech companies and and so I think that the mood is positive because they see that uh, inflation inflation is gonna is going to come down we're kind of breathing a sigh of relief out here in San Francisco at the Bloomberg Bureau now that the kind of the bulk of yeah. earnings season is over. If you were to draw up your scorecard from earnings, particularly with the mega caps, what is your takeaway from this earnings season? Well, I think it's been mixed. Uh, but in general, uh, a lot of the companies exceeded uh, expectations, both on the revenue side and on the, on the earnings side. And I think the name of the game is not going to be revenue. The name of the game is going to be earnings and what happens with earnings. And earnings always look backward. You know, you're, you're talking about the last quarter. I think the big question with earnings is what's going to happen in the next two quarters. And that's why I think that good news about getting control over inflation is what's causing this rally. You note that historically, tech in the first half of, of a year uh, not not the best play, but then does rebound. And we've kind of seen that in the third quarter. Do you expect tech to continue to have momentum in the second half of 2022? It's hard for me to say the second half of 2022, but I definitely see it in 2023 and 2024. And what, where are those opportunities? What will drive that? Because I, I think that tech is going to be the way to deal with inflation is through productivity. What's going to help us with productivity is tech. And you have all the corporates spending money on uh, their capex on tech. And so I, I think that we're going to definitely see tech continue to, to improve. Now, the valuations got a little bit out of control before. And so I, I think that, um, you know, interest rates, um, interest rates going up and the discount rate that's implied in that in terms of earnings has actually is what's made uh, valuations come down. But I think... Earnings over time will be great for tech companies. I think, and actually, in slower growth periods, tech tends to do quite well. You've been all across the inflation story, but I notice you also have been across the semiconductor space. What have you learned from the chip makers in the last couple of weeks? Interesting that, um, that and I was surprised, actually, at, at some of the um, earnings and some of the forward guidance, especially, on the chip makers. Uh, but again, I think as the economy picks up, there will be more and more demand. And I think there's great opportunity. They did very well today. Mel, what, I love speaking with you because you, you take such a broad view of the technology sector and you're always focused on cloud and AI. What, why is it that you see such opportunity in what are sometimes regarded as nascent spaces? Well, because I think that the opportunity for productivity with all of these technologies is tremendous. 
I think more and more companies are using AI to um, to improve their business models. I think more and more of us are going into the cloud. I think, you know, uh, com the computing power is going to grow exponentially, and I think it's going to totally transform the way we work. It already did after COVID. I think we've got this whole whole other leg coming uh, that we can't even imagine what some of those changes are going to be. Well, Mel Lagomasino, CEO of We Family Offices, great to have you late on a Friday. Happy weekend. Thank we'll you. see you again Happy soon. Weekend. Okay. All right, coming. Thank you, Mel. Coming up, more e-commerce headwinds despite a massive jump in engagement. I'll chat with Poshmark's CEO about his industry outlook. This is Bloomberg. Shares of online secondhand goods marketplace Poshmark dropped 8% on Thursday, the biggest decline since May. The company gave a weaker than hoped sales forecast for the third quarter as growth has been held back by higher inflation and a changing global economy. But there were some bright spots as user engagement on Poshmark jumped 70% year on year. Joining us to break it all down and cast an eye on the future is Poshmark CEO Manish Chandra. So Manish, you know, the market's clearly focusing on this this sales outlook. What were the factors behind that, around that, that pressure on sales growth? Well, we, uh, if you look at our Q2 results, we started, we beat uh, the guidance on uh, both revenue and, uh, and sort of came to the midpoint on the earnings. I think uh, when we look into the future, when you look at Q3, one of the good things that's happening is that we are starting to see our growth and our, our rhythm and cadence be more like 2019, which is pre-COVID, uh, which is a healthy thing for Poshmark, because as people are going out, participating, participating in events, going to weddings, you know, going back to school, it's a great thing because you need fashion, you need to rotate your closet, and people are going back to the closet and then rotating it. Uh, so that's a good thing, but we are being cautious. I mean, it's early, uh, we're sort of want to observe it for a few months, uh, and that's reflected in our guidance. Manish, remind us how Poshmark works. Essentially, you're pairing sellers of, of secondhand goods with buyers of secondhand goods, right? But talk to me a little bit about the profile of, of user on the platform, the types of folks that are buying goods there. Yeah, Poshmark is, is unique in the sense that we allow you to turn your closet into a shop. So it really appeals to millions of people out there who have a closet. I think uh, almost everyone has a closet, has some excess stuff to sell. So we really make it very easy to take that closet and start selling it. We provide everything uh, built into the platform is shipping, uh, payment processing, et cetera. And the beautiful thing is the item goes straight from the seller to the buyer. So we hold no inventory. And that allows us to have an extremely dynamic assortment, uh, which has been a strong point, uh, particularly in this changing sense of fashion going into the pandemic, coming out of it, going into uh, from active wear to work wear to back to school wear. Uh, and then on the flip side, we have uh, people who are shopping these closets, both for getting values and bargains, but also getting access to wide assortment. Everything you want, we believe, is in somebody's closet. So we put them all together. Uh, and that's right. posh. Manish, I want to get into the psychology of the consumer, but what, what kind of lens do you get into the health of the consumer? Are their users shopping on your platform because they're feeling the pain of inflation, so they're looking to the secondhand goods market rather than buying off the high street, you know, off you know, new products. What are the kind of macro uh, characteristics that you're seeing in your, in your users? Uh, first thing is consumers are looking for value. Consumers are always looking for value, but in these inflationary times, they're especially looking for value. Number two is consumers' preference and tastes are changing. And a lot of times traditional retail is not able to keep up. And what you're seeing with a lot of first supply chain famine and now sort of retail store glut is this mismatch of computer supply and demand, uh, sorry, consumer supply and demand. And what we see with Poshmark is this ability to dynamically match from the closets, from people, this supply and demand. So that's the second thing is people are looking for latest trendy things and that trends are changing. But right. the flip side of the Poshmark is that consumers can also make money. And as people are sort of looking for extra sources of income, Poshmark can provide that as well. Talk to me about Poshmark parties. What is a Poshmark party? 
So two things, we have virtual parties that are happening online where people are selling together. Uh, we'll have a team and thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people will come together. In fact, our evening parties are so big that I've seen parties in the last few weeks that have hit 10 million items being listed in a single party from across the country. So they are really a group selling event where people are coming, buying and selling together. And then we take them physical. Uh, so we hosted a party in LA a couple of weeks back and next week we have one in New York City. And there we have hundreds of sellers who come together, they connect with each other, they help each other, they learn from each other, get inspired. And we also have new sellers coming in uh, where we help them activate their closets. And people who've just joined Poshmark can learn there's something called closet consultation. They can see how to run their online business faster. So they become sort of a small manifestation of these virtual events. Our Bloomberg Intelligence analyst, Poonam Goyal, is also excited about Poshmark's potential for growth outside of North America, international markets. Could you update us on the plans there? Yeah, our, our, our Canadian business just hit 4 million users. We sort of celebrated three-year mark uh, and has more than a billion dollars of inventory listed. So that market is coming along. Uh, and we launched in Australia and India during the pandemic. And as we are coming out of it, we are seeing the engagement and physical events starting to build the communities there. Uh, so we believe the paradigm of really finding the future of fashion inside your closet is well alive, not just in US and Canada, but in other countries as well. All right, well, we'll look for updates on those new markets as they come online. Poshmark CEO Manish Chandra, thank you very much for joining us. The update on the secondhand goods market. Meanwhile, delivery startup GoPuff is tapping a new CFO to help it become profitable. Panera Bread's CFO Ted Stedham will join the same role for GoPuff, according to sources. Stedham worked at WeWork as global head of business planning and financial operations. He also served as CFO at Yum Brands China Business. Coming up, Europe's drought will further raise energy prices and disrupt trade as the Rhine River's water levels dip below a crucial mark. This is Bloomberg. This gas storage itself is not sufficient. We are facing a crisis at the moment. It's been produced by the cut off of Russian gas, but it tells us yet again just how volatile and uncertain fossil fuel prices are. Gas prices will remain very high, and it also may result in some disruption. We cannot magically get sort of uh, tens or hundreds of, of gigawatts of renewable energy before winter. So it is a matter of saving energy, it's a matter of securing sources. There should be uh, more um, obligatory measures uh, to, reduce, uh, to reduce consumption. The first step obviously is to become independent of Russian supplies, which in the end can only be managed by additional imports, mostly uh, LNG. Here today we've seen the, this, uh, the reduction in the gas consumption by about 10% in the EU. I think the effect of this crisis will be that Europe will be further down the path to emissions reductions than it would otherwise be. That's some of the commentary on the energy crunch Europe is currently enduring. And things don't look much better on the trade front. Germany's Rhine River has dropped to a level that could disrupt the transport of fuel throughout Europe. The effects could ripple through the continent for months. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson explains. As of this afternoon here in Europe, the Rhine River has become impassable at the critical waypoint of Kaub, just to the west of Frankfurt. This is something that we've been anticipating for really quite some time. You can see the water levels uh, as they've been dropping uh, over the last few months. They have now dropped through the critical 40 centimetre point at Kaub. That's just under 16 inches. That means effectively the, the river is no longer navigable for large barges. Now, this is crucial for Europe, not just for Germany, but for the whole of Europe. Let me show you what the map uh, looks like here. So you've got Rat Rotterdam up here uh, on the coast. The River Rhine runs through Germany, through Cologne, uh, just to the west of Frankfurt. There's Kaub, and then runs through the rest of Germany down towards Switzerland. This is a hugely important waterway. It transports all kinds of things up and down for Germany and for the whole of Europe. Think about coal, think about gas, 
Think about diesel. All of these things go up and down this river. Big chemicals companies uh, are to the east of Cowb as well. They will now be restricted. Uh, big power plants that, that require coal to be floated up the river on barges will now see those supplies restricted. This comes at a time when Europe is already facing a massive energy crisis. The fact that we now have a drought in Europe that is lowering these uh, river levels is only going to exacerbate that problem and pour further pressure on politicians to do more to deal with this economic crisis that is looming and getting worse and worse as we head towards winter here in Europe. So as of today, the Rhine is now closed at Kaub and it, looked like, and it looks like it's not going to rain for a while. Thanks to Bloomberg's Guy Johnson in London for that update on the Rhine River. Some other stories to watch. Three of China's biggest state-owned companies plan to delist from U.S. exchanges. That's fallout from a dispute over whether American regulators should be allowed to inspect audits of Chinese businesses whose shares are listed in the U.S. The three companies that will delist are China Life, PetroChina and Sinopec. Masayoshi Sun has now lost more than $4 billion on a series of side deals he set up at SoftBank to boost his compensation. The Japanese billionaire took the unusual step of establishing personal stakes in a series of SoftBank ventures in recent years. That was a mixing of company and executive interests that drew the ire of investors. And Amazon, Oracle and other data providers were pressed by a group of lawmakers about how they sell mobile phone location data. The companies offered assurances that the information could not be used to track women seeking abortion services. The Supreme Court's decision to overturn women's federal right to abortion has sparked concerns that location data can be used by law enforcement in states that have outlawed or restricted abortion to prosecute people who seek reproductive care. Coming up, it's retail earnings bonanza next week. We'll take a deep dive into that, e-commerce trends to watch out for, and much more. This is Bloomberg. bring you some breaking news and headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal. The House has enough votes to send a roughly $437 billion tax, climate and drug price package to President Biden's desk. The inflation reduction bill is designed to boost the U.S. transition to clean energy and alleviate costs. We'll chat more about the bill's impact on electric vehicles later this hour. This is Bloomberg Technology. I am Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. For more on Peloton's news, let's bring in Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos, who's out in D.C. Jackie, what did we learn from Peloton on Friday? Absolutely. Well, uh, for customers, you know, prices are going to be hiked up. And it's kind of a reversal from what we saw in April when we saw a price cut for the bike and the treadmill. Um, so if you were looking for a deal, you may have missed out on that one. But it's really part of this broader plan to uh, shift more of its costs from the hardware side of the business to higher margin memberships. And, you know, layoffs are uh, expected to impact around 800 people, mostly concentrated and you know, the customer service and distribution and um, delivery type functions. And this is really bigger picture part of this broader strategy to overhaul the cost structure and redirect more of its co uh, capital to research and development. You know, the memo to employees that Barry McCarthy uh, sent earlier today, you know, he outlines this rationale that, you know, you need to spur innovation to spur revenue growth. And that's going to be right. key, especially when they've been burning so much capital. Barry McCarthy, the Peloton CEO, said in this internal memo uh, that ca uh, cash is oxygen and oxygen is life. And clearly, you know, they're worried about 
their, their operating health, if you will. But what's the wider context here, Jackie? They did layoffs in February as well. Is, is it that the demand for the product has disappeared, that people just simply aren't using Peloton hardware anymore? You know, I think it's a combination of things. The economic outlook has certainly shifted since the beginning of the year. And when he joined uh, earlier in February, you know, it was already undergoing this major turnaround plan, but it wasn't really sure where some of the pain points were. Was it demand? Uh, was it just kind of this broader, grim outlook? And what we're seeing now is that, you know, they signaled they expect demand to soften going forward. And when consumer spend is really on the line, a luxury premium product like Peloton is more vulnerable. And, you know, so future growth um, is is somewhat hanging in the fray, especially, um, you know, they've signaled that sales aren't going to be as strong. Now, when it comes to saving money, this is where uh, you've seen somewhat of a vacillating in strategy. You know, when they uh, upped that membership cost earlier in, in April, um, that was signaling that, look, this is somewhere, this is an area that they want to tap uh, going forward. It's higher margin. It's recurring predictable revenue. So you're definitely going to start to see them lean into that as the demand side of the picture right. becomes more uncertain. Well, investors certainly like what they saw, the stock jumping almost 14%. Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos out in D.C. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Let's turn to retail earnings. Lots coming up next week from the likes of Walmart and Macy's. So let's take a little look ahead and talk about what to expect with Nikki Baird, VP of Strategy for the global retail technology company Aptos, and my good mate, Bloomberg's own Brendan Case out in Dallas. And Brendan, I'm going to start with you. You know, this is the week for you, right? You're going to be at your desk. I know you're going to be just so much coffee, so much coffee bracing for what's to come. But actually, we already have a good sense of what's to come, don't we? That's exactly right. It is going to be a big week, but it's going to be a week that's sort of a sequel to an announcement that Walmart made a few weeks ago in which it warned that its profits were going to be down more than expected. And the reason for that is that inflation is just hitting people really hard, and it's leaving them with less money to spend, especially on general merchandise um, as opposed to groceries. Uh, and I think what we'll, what we'll be looking for next week, we'll be looking for any kind of clues or commentary they offer about how they see a, the, the state of the consumer and, 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 and how people are going to be able to hold up or not as the rest of the year goes on. So we've already heard from Amazon, the big sort of e-commerce giant. And actually, earlier in the year, we spoke to Andy Jassy, and this was his kind of assessment of the inflation story. Have a listen. We thought that inflation would start to attenuate in 2022. And with the war in Ukraine, it just went the other way and has significantly accelerated. And so the cost of trucking and line haul and ocean and air and fuel has just substantially gone up. And uh, I think that will attenuate at some point. No one knows how long that'll take. So, Nikki, I, I played that sound bite, which was from June, the first week of June, because it seems like, in some sense, the path for inflation caught retailers off guard a little bit. Did, did the industry just kind of get inflation and, and how the consumer reacted wrong? I, I don't know that they necessarily got the inflation part wrong. I mean, a lot of the goods that are on shelves in June were things that were purchased before gas prices really went up, before some of those stronger things really hit that drove prices up uh, in other places like in grocery where the supply chain is much shorter. But uh, I do think it surprised them how much consumer demand there was and how much consumers were still willing to spend um, you know, as things opened up more. I think we're starting to see the impact of that now where uh, July, I think, isn't going to be as strong retail sales as June was. Some of it is inflation biting into that discretionary spending, but I think as well, some of it is uh, everybody's on vacation, everybody's out traveling, they're shifting their spending to other places. Brendan, what's the e-commerce story here? Because I think one of the big stories of the pandemic era was the change in how consumers behaved and how those retailers had to adapt to meet that demand. What are we talking about now in the context of e-commerce? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's going to be a big watch item, too, for this quarter and, and, and the quarters to come. What you've been seeing most recently is that at the big mass market retailers, uh, you know, such as Walmart and Target, you're seeing 
the growth rate slow down or even flatten out for uh, e-commerce demand. But a big part of that is just because people are going back to stores this year. They feel a lot better from, from a COVID kind of perspective. And uh, another thing that's sort of noteworthy about e-commerce demand this year is that while the growth has slowed, it's still kind of holding its own. It's not as if it's going away. And just how fast that expands in the coming quarters, in the coming years, that's one of the biggest and most important questions in front of these retailers. And they're all investing a lot of money to be ready for that yeah. demand uh, under the assumption that the e-commerce part of it will be steadily rising, if not soaring the way it did during the pandemic. Yes. Nikki, it's an interesting time of year in summer. And, and you, there are some names that you feel will do better than others and some trends like the vacation trend that might have a factor in this quarter's earnings. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's are coming up from an earnings perspective. And uh, for sure, people already spent their money on improving their home and they want to get out of that home. They don't want to sit on their deck. They want to sit on another hotel's pool deck instead. So uh, that, I think, definitely is driving a lot of consumer behavior. And I think it's interesting to see just how much retailers sort of anticipated that that, that pandemic behavior was going to continue and were taken somewhat by surprise when they really did shift hard to kind of different priorities from a spending perspective this year. Yeah, well, one to watch for next week. Nikki Baird, VP of Strategy at Aptos and Bloomberg's Brendan Case, of course, thanks to you both. Happy weekend. Coming up, we'll talk about Ethereum's winning streak. And by the way, is the merge finally happening? Really? More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Time for our crypto report now. And Ether jumped 10% this week for a sixth straight week of gains. This in anticipation of a groundbreaking software upgrade to its blockchain. Ethereum's upgrade has been long awaited and news around it has been welcomed by investors who have pushed its token price up by roughly 80% over the past month. Let's bring in Bloomberg's David Pan out in New York for more. David, everyone's been weighing in on this. The merge, it's close, it's exciting. <laughs> Ethereum's all over the shop. Is it actually going to happen? Right. So the merge has been on the roadmap of uh, the Ethereum blockchain uh, project's development um, since its inception in 2015. There have been several uh, delays uh, in the past several years, and um, there has been sus suspicion of the time of the merge. But um, um, based on the conversations with um, investors and developers, uh, they are more confident than ever that the merge will happen in the next couple of months based on a couple of reasons. And firstly, uh, we've seen uh, the merge on the test net uh, being completed with without major technical glitches, which is the promising sign that shows the merge will actually happen in the near future. Uh, secondly, right. if we look at the derivatives market, in particular, the Ether options market, we're seeing a lot of investors who are betting on a price hike during around the time of the merge. So those, uh, those two things kind of indicate that you know, um, there is a fairly high confidence level of for the merge to happen in the near future. Well, it, it seems like investors are positioning for this to happen, right? They're, they're trying to get in because they anticipate further upward movement in Ethereum. But then there's a school of thought that when it actually happens, we'll see a crash. Explain that logic to us. Yeah, so, um, so you know, like um, there is a saying in the crypto space, you know, sell the news. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, we have to remember that crypto market is a highly speculative market and a lot of hot money uh, speculative capital, you know, will be flowing from the large scale uh, investors into the market around the time when the merge happened because they are in search of uh, arbitrage opportunities in the time of high volatility. And another reason might be that, you know, um, there might be other potential technical uh, difficulties or glitches uh, happening after the merge, which would discourage investors to invest more, to put more money into the, into the project. So those are the two major reasons, um, you know, 
based on my conversations with uh, investors and core developers behind the project. All right, all eyes on Ethereum then. Bloomberg's David Penn, thank you. Have a great weekend out in New York. Coming up, Congress now has enough votes to pass a roughly 437 billion initiative, but can it help the EV market bounce back? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Let's look at the week that was in the world of electric vehicles, with Nikola beating expectations last week and announcing an executive shakeup this week, and Rivian cutting its annual earnings forecast, saying it would have a larger than previously guided loss on inflationary woes. And now we'll talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, which Congress has just voted to pass and pass on to the President Biden and his desk, which the President says, according to headlines crossing the Bloomberg, he will sign next week. The bill could deliver a boost to electric commercial vehicles in this macro environment. Joining me now is Olaf Sackers, general partner at Red Blue Capital, a VC focused on early stage companies in the mobility and automotive space, and Bloomberg's own Carl Stock out on the East Coast. So you and I, Olaf, have discussed this bill through its passage. What's your reaction now that it seems real and done? So there are a few things that are happening all at once. The one is that there's a lot of political jostling in order to get this deal through. Um, and it creates short-term confusion um, because it kind of immediately changes the subsidy regime, changes the rules around it. Um, and, and that's going to create a little bit of confusion in the near term. It does correct for some of the things that were problematic in the pre-existing EV subsidies, okay. uh, that they were effectively regressive, that wealthy people were the ones that it could, could afford high-end you know, Hummer EVs and Teslas, and yet, you know, those aren't necessarily the people you want to be subsidizing with tax dollars. Now the, the bill is shifting the thresholds for who qualifies and which vehicles qualify to be more focused on the middle class. But it is still fundamentally regressive, in a sense. Well, why do you believe, I, I think your school of thought is that it misses the point that actually there's a, a much broader section of the global automotive market that needs attention, that needs more support to electrify? Well, it's not just the automotive market. I think what you need to think about is what is the point of cars? They move people and they, to some extent, move goods, especially if somebody's going to Walmart or something, they're, they're holding stuff uh, in their vehicle. But what we should be focusing on if we care about climate, and the two things that are attention in this bill, and we can get to them, one is America first, like these policies around American manufacturing, et cetera, yes. and the other is around climate. But if you care about that second bucket, the climate bucket. What you care about is not electrifying vehicles, not making cars that people own that drive 4% of the time electric, but rather electrifying miles. And the miles that really matter are the ones that are driven by fleets um, of various kinds, whether it's commercial fleets, trucks, uh, delivery vans, but also fleets like uh, scooter fleets um, in cities like San Francisco, um, which are also high utilization. And also for delivery uh, of, of food, uh, a company like DoorDash is doing 1.6 billion trips a year. You know, why isn't there a focus on commercializing those trips uh, and subsidizing those trips uh, through these kinds of subsidies? So a big focus on the consumer. I want to bring Bloomberg, Bloomberg's Carl Stock into the conversation. And Kyle, you know, give us a sense of where we're at in electrification in America. You wrote a fantastic story last week that basically points out that if you're anywhere in the States, but on the West Coast, for example, and you want to take a road trip, a classic American road trip in an EV, it's not that easy. Talk yeah. me through it. Well, I think EV adoption is, is, is sort of ahead of where the narrative is. I think Americans are open to these vehicles, but the charging infrastructure here is still a big challenge. We lag China, Europe, South Korea, even Japan when it comes to the number of places to charge a vehicle quickly. Um, if you're outside of the Tesla universe. So that's because we haven't had subsidies like this in the past. We haven't had, you know, robust policy like they have in Scandinavia and in China um, to really put these cords out there in the wild. And not just that, you know, Whole Foods or the gym or um, your office, but at a national park, at the Grand Canyon, you know, that's still kind of 
off the map for someone taking an EV road trip right now. So, you know, this bill speaks to that, but Biden's uh, giant infrastructure package also speaks to that $5 billion that's going to start to be deployed this autumn um, should help cover a lot of those EV deserts, but we're not really there yet in terms of where you can go in these vehicles. The other area is this whole energy crisis and, and the, the motivation to move to EVs. In your reporting in recent weeks and months, what do you see in the U.S. consumer in terms of their willingness to transition to EVs, their ability to afford an EV? The affordability is a huge chunk of it. I mean, these cars are, they were expensive to begin with. They're getting more expensive now because of the supply crisis, because dealerships can add on these market adjustment rates. Um, and even if you're paying a sticker price, you're waiting months for one of these cars. So that's a big issue. A big thing in the bill that that uh, is is going through now is a provision for a rebate for used EVs. And this is massive. Like, Anyone in the EV universe is thrilled about this because in America, 70 to 80 percent of cars that are purchased are pre-owned. So this is the lion's share of the market. So to, to sort of have something that speaks to that buyer could move the needle drastically for the, for the space. So that's the kind of consumer side of the story from Kyle. And again, you know, your point is that you, we shouldn't just focus on cars. So if I said to you, here's a pen, go back and, and rewrite the bill as you would have written it, what would you have put in there to, to hit those targets, reducing emissions and advancing a transition to sustainable energy? Yeah, I think the focus on you know, going to um, a national park or something like that is not how people actually use cars. Cars are designed today. Uh, for family to go to a picnic, right, and have all this trunk space and all the, the kids in the car. But in reality, most of the vehicles are actually being used to commute, or they're being used for trips that people take for retail. Um, and usually there's only one person driving that car. Um, and so I, I wrote a book, and the book is basically about the transition to what I call the trip economy, basically these trip marketplaces that bring things to you or take you places, Uber, uh, Amazon, DoorDash, these are all different ways in which you can buy trips for specific purposes. And this trip economy rationalizes all the efficiencies, inefficiencies of car ownership. Car ownership is extremely wasteful. Think about all the metal that's being moved all the way to take you anywhere that you're going that's just unnecessary. Um, and and the, the real opportunity is to not electrify the energy that's being used to move all that weight, but actually to change how much energy is needed in the first place to move people and goods. Um, for the economic purposes of growing the economy, et cetera. So if I were to rewrite the bill, I'd be focused on those kinds of opportunities, um, focus on commercial fleets and how do you accelerate uh, electrification. If you look at where electrification is really happening today, it's, it's buses in cities. They've already, close to 50% of, of those buses have already transitioned. Um, if you look at Amazon, you mentioned Rivian before, they, they made a massive purchase of Rivian vehicles. Um, and that's really what would, is the tailwind behind Rivian. Right. Um, those, those are the use cases that really um, have rapid adoption. And those vehicles are the ones that are doing high amounts of miles. Uh, DoorDash is using e-bikes in many cities uh, to deliver goods. And they're bundling the, amounts, the, the, the packages that are being delivered. So you don't have to, instead of having consumers take individual trips to a store, you've got multiple trips being bundled into one, uh, one ride. And similarly with Uber, you're seeing in London under pressure from uh, the, from TFL, that Uber is actually much more quickly electrifying than, than consumer fleets. So that's, that's if you want to shift electri miles to electrification, right. that's, that's, those are the things you should be focusing on. We could have spoken about this all, all night, all weekend, perhaps. Big thanks to Olaf Seger's general partner at Red Blue Capital and Bloomberg's Kyle Stock, good mate of mine out on the East Coast. Thanks to you both. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Monday, we have BBG Ventures President Student Line to chat big tech regulation and the investing landscape. Don't forget to check out our podcast. You can find it on the terminal, as well as online on Apple, Spotify, and on iHeart. This is Bloomberg.